So I'm going to talk about my PhD project. And um, so we need all more clean energy. The, the reason is that uh, if you look at the, the consumption of energy in the last uh, 50 years, the, it has increased of, uh, around five times. And out of that, 80% is coming from uh, fossil fuels. So we don't know exactly when, but we are sure that this 80% at some point will be over. And we are kind of left with the 7% of renewable energy sources. Out of those only, let's say 1% is coming from sun, and uh, 48 of this is uh, from biomass and a bit of wind and uh, hydropower. On the other side, we know that the burning fossil fuels, we have uh, a lot of pollutants like CO2, NOx, uh, PM10, and uh, even smaller particles. With uh, all the related problems for our health and uh, the, with the greenhouse gases and so on. So, we want to find new energy sources or to use it a bit more efficiently. And uh, we look at this problem looking at the energy from the sun and in particular the photoelectrochemical cells. So, these are my conclusions. I will look at, I mean, we have screened for materials for uh, these uh, photoelectrochemical cells. We found four material, 40 materials for one and two photo water splitting. We have used a lot of this uh, GLRV SSC potential and we found that it works pretty well for the uh, band gap calculations. And then we have looked at something more uh, standard, like the thin film solar cells, or usual photovoltaics, and we found 70 materials for a single layer thin film. Uh, first of all, we start with the photoelectrochemical cells. So, what is that? Is uh, uh, we have a light, uh, the light from the sun coming, and it absorbs by it is absorbed by a bar and an body or by this uh, photo absorber and the electronal pair is created, then the electrons go, there is a surface, and uh, the electron is uh, evolving hydrogen, and the hole is evolving uh, uh, oxygen. This is a complicated process because uh, essentially you have three main points, light absorption, electronal mobility, and then to induce the reaction, so some uh, catalytic activity. A few examples are this titanium dioxide back in the 72s, but it has an efficiency very low, I think it's less than 1%. And then some more recent is the solid solution of gallium nitride zinc oxide or zinc germanium nitrogen and zinc oxide uh, from this uh, group in Japan. Um, there are several properties required for a material to, to split water. In particular, we want to have something that is chemical, chemically and structurally stable. Then a uh, band gap in the visible range to absorb a good part of the solar spectrum. Band edge position in the right way compared to the uh, to the um, levels of uh, water and uh, to the redox levels of water and then we want to have a good mobility, good catalytic properties and then maybe low cost and low toxicity. So we focus mainly on the first uh, three points and uh, there are really some solutions more than the, the three I mentioned before. Uh, some of them, in any way it's difficult to find materials with a good band gap and at the same time with the band edges position in the right way. For example, these four materials, they have a very, the band edges are well positioned, but the band gap is too large. So they, they absorb only a few percent of the solar spectrum. On the other side, silicon is 1.1, uh, silicon, band gap semiconductor, and it's a very good to absorb light, but the position of the band edges are wrong, so they really can evolve only hydrogen and no, no oxygen. Some other, like uh, this uh, cadmium sulfide, instead are, uh, they corrode. So there is also a problem of corrosion that has to be taken into account. Um, we look at the one single, one structure. This is the cubic curve sky. Why? Because it's uh, very common. It shows uh, several chemical elements can be used into that. It has usually very high stability and a variety of properties like ferroelectricity, magnetism, catalytic activity, and so on. And is uh, first of all, computationally <coughs> cheap. So it's only five atoms in itself. That means that we can perform several thousands of calculations in a reasonable time. Uh, we start from 52 elements from the periodic table, with the one in white, so we have excluded the non-metals and the radioactive and toxic, and with the different dynamics, the one in uh, uh, so in total we screen for something like 19,000 cubic perovskites. Uh, the method we use, we have uh, three main criteria. So it's the stability, 
band gap and band edge position. For the stability, we have evaluated the stability compared to a poor reference system into which the material, the perovskite, can decompose. So it's around 400 uh, compounds in this pool of reference, and uh, these are coming from the from an experimental database. So it's a structure that are already known. And uh, they include uh, metal bulk, metal oxides, nitrides, and so on. B metal oxide, nitrides, single and metal oxynitride. Several inter uh, then we have compared with several interesting uh, structures. We have uh, used the standard RBB function for the structure optimization and the calculation of energy. And the stability is coming from a linear, solving a linear programming uh, uh, linear equation where this is the uh, energy of the perovskite and um, this is the most stable outcome from the <coughs> universal reference systems. So if delta E is lower than 0.2 EV per atom, then we define the material is stable. Otherwise, we not, it's considered non stable and we keep it out. Second is the calculation band gap. We've used the GLBSC. And uh, as it was uh, said yesterday, it uh, gives the quasi particle band gap in terms of the Konishan gap plus the difference. It has a very low computational cost, especially compared with many bad methods of most of these methods. And we find an error of 0.5 V compared to experiments when we look at the band gaps of around 40 metal oxides, single metal oxides. The third ingredient is the evaluation of band edges. Usually, if we want to calculate this with DFT, it's kind of complicated because we need to make a, a slab and uh, check all the different surfaces, find the most stable one, and then maybe also uh, understanding the role of water and pH in how the, 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 band, the, the edges change with water and pH on the surface. So we have used this empirical formula that uh, gives the band edges in terms of the electronegativity in the Mannequin scale, that is just the average between the electron affinity and the first ionization potential. And then uh, we had them reduce uh, half of the band gap. And uh, each view here is just a standard sheet to convert it from back to the normal hydrogen. Uh, let's go to the results, and uh, this is the uh, all the 2,700 calculations we did for the AEO3 cubic perovskite. Uh, each triangle is a different combination. In the lower triangle, we have the heat formation, and the upper triangle, the band gap. So red means that the material is stable, and blue is unstable. And for the gap, instead, the visible range region is a uh, reddish. So a good material is uh, spot by a, a blue square. Uh, we found several, uh, three different uh, rules for stability and band gap. In particular, this, uh, one of these is well known, that it's coming from the Goldschmidt uh, tolerance factor, that says that not all the elements can occupy either the A or the B position. So it's kind of a suggestion which kind of, uh, based on the atomic radius, which element can be in the A and which one can be in the B position. Instead, of these are more for the band gaps. We want to have an even number of electrons in the unit cell, otherwise we have a band that is uh, half filled or with uh, some electrons crossing the formula. And then we wanted the, some of the possible oxidation states must be equal to six. Six because it's coming from the three, we have three oxygens, each one provides us for two electrons, so A and B is six pro, to, to give out six electrons. Uh, we found 13 materials from this, uh, just applying the first two criteria, so the band gap and stability. And then we apply also the band edge uh, evaluation, so we end up with something like 10. And uh, uh, some of them are already known, like there's a silver and iodium or um, barium tin. Silver and iodium actually is proof to work with a small efficiency, I think it's like 1% or half percent. And um, instead, the uh, barium tin is, uh, is not working because of defect uh, and answer combination. On the other side, other two materials like the strontium tin and calcium tin, they are known in the orthonomic perovskite. The orthonomic perovskite is just a distorted perovskite, but usually the octahedral tilting is also uh, opening up the band gap. So the most stable, the most known uh, stable structure, usually the band gap is above the three years uh, threshold we we set. Uh, out of the, the, the others instead are not known and. Uh, it would be nice if someone can start uh, trying to uh, synthesize those. 
If we look at all the sets of materials, so this 19,000, so when we have oxygen and some uh, nitrogen, sulfur, or chlorine, <coughs> we end up with uh, 20 candidates. So we found a 10 in the ABO3 structure, and one is going to work. Five in the oxynitrite, this one. So and uh, actually here four are not, are not to work. So the oxynitrites, they usually have a, they, they're very good in uh, in splitting water, both because of band gap and band edge position, but also because of the catalytic activity. In particular, the lantern titanate here, it, it's currently um, experimentally work in our department, so it's uh, it's under investigation, also experimentally. Um, of the this oxygen trial with the two nitrogens in the unit, so then we have uh, one, two materials and one is not, and instead when we replace uh, oxygen with fluorine, we found three. Uh, compounds, but none of them is, uh, is not experimental. Uh, we have also compared the GL BSC potential with the uh, uh, GNOT up, up over the LDA, uh, starting with the LDA density, and we found a good agreement between the two methods with a narrow of around 0.35, the mean absolute error is around. And um, the good part is that the GLB is which computationally way cheaper. Than the, G, the GW. So uh, you can run a screen, with GW, a screen with GW, instead you can do with the GLD and maybe just uh, make a better, uh, just uh, do a cross processing and uh, study a bit more in detail the interesting materials with more fancy methods. Uh, so far we have compared the stability only with the solid substances, but another problem is that these materials do work in contact with water. So it, uh, we ask uh, how is, are those materials? compared to corrosion. Can we say that they are still stable or what? Uh, for that we have to use the so-called Pube diagrams that uh, are better stability diagrams in, uh, depending on the potential and pH of the, uh, of the, of the, of the, of the environment. Uh, the, the stability is evaluated with the, that equation, so where we have the reagents and water that is going to produce hydrogen uh, ions and the electrons. And um, this is the, the, doing some math, you end up with an energy equation. Yeah. So the, all the solid energies are coming from DFT. Instead, the, 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 sol, the, the solution energies are coming from experiments. So it's also a way to combine DFT with experimental results. Uh, this is the Courbet diagrams for zinc. And we can find three main lines. So the vertical one. The vertical line is when we have solid and dissolved substances and hydrogen ions. And uh, basically, this is independent on the pH. On the horizontal lines, uh, sorry, it's independent of the potential. On the horizontal lines, instead, uh, we have uh, uh, solid and dissolved substances, but uh, we have free electrons. And this time, it's staying independent on the, on the pH. And then, something like uh, with, uh, with a slope that is equal to this ratio, where we have all the, the ingredients on it. Uh, first of all, we compare DFT and the experiment, I mean the Courbet diagrams obtained just with DFT and also only with the uh, experiment. So this one for zinc and that was for titanium. Uh, they are pretty close. There are some few discrepancies and uh, they are due mainly for inaccuracy in the calculations, like this. Or because uh, we have the, in uh, DFT we have the possibility of studying more materials, more, we have more data compared to experiments. So, like, uh, if you look at the titanium here, there are some few phases that are not available. Uh, sorry, there are few phases that are not available experimentally. Uh, now we move to three, uh, to two metal, uh, metal oxide, and uh, apparently not the no cubic perovskite is a stable if we take a threshold of zero electron volts per atom. So, um, this mainly is because of the beta ions they don't include the reactor, the reaction kinetics. So there is a term that is uh, wants to keep the structure uh, by itself instead of dissolving, and this is not including in the beta ions. Uh, one solution can be to increase uh, the energy threshold to so something like 0.2 or 0.5 in order to somehow to cope with this uh, uh, reaction uh, with uh, this kinetic term that is missing. Uh, we have looked at the nine mole perovskite that are stable, and uh, out of those only the potassium tantal is uh, stable with a threshold of 0 0.2, but few more they get stable if we use an energy threshold of 0.5. That uh, is that the one we will use later, in particular the strontium tantal and the barium tantal. 
uh, those are the candidates for the water for water splitting, and we found that usually oxide and oxy fluorides they have a region when they where they are stable in this energy threshold with this energy threshold of 0.5 per atom, while oxy nitrides are less stable and especially at the high potential. This is because they, when they, they dissolve, they usually have a lot of free electrons. And this is, I mean, it changes a lot the stability when you have the uh, free electrons in terms of potential. Um, using just one photon, we, don't, we can't get uh, very high efficiencies. I think it's a decent effort. So. A solution can be used in a two photon uh, system or tandem cell, where we have the one semiconductor that is. Uh, uh, absorbing the large part of the solar spectrum and is responsible mainly for the oxygen evolution and one that is uh, uh, absorbing the lower part of the solar spectrum and that is responsible for hydrogen uh, We consider for the hydrogen evolution silicon because of the mature uh, technology and uh, because it has a very good uh, band gap of 1.1 uh, eV that is perfect for, for, GSF pro, for solving this problem and instead we do the screening for the O2 photocatalyst so the requirements for this kind of materials is again uh, structural and chemical stability. Band gaps, the optimal is 1.1 and 1.7, and then we show you a slide why. And then band edges matching with the two um, redox potential letters of water, and there is more overlap here to let the electron and also combine to take the charge and the system. Uh, why is a 1.1 and 1.7? So Basically, we, to, the, to split water, we need 1.23 electron. And then we have a 0.5, I'm uh, sorry, 0.25 per quasi Fermi level. Because uh, we have to somehow describe the non equilibrium of the electron and uh, the Fermi level. So we have a 2 at 1, and then we have the over potential for, op over potentials for oxygen, for oxygen and hydrogen, that accounts again for 0.5, and the small overlap here. To, to let the electron power in one. So in total we end up with 2.8. And if we look at the efficiency there, um, the, the, the conversion efficiency for, uh, the, for this tandem cell, when we, once we fix the band gap of the H2, the, the H2 photocatalyst, then you can look at the, what is the efficiency given for, as a function of the different uh, the band gaps for the other the semiconductor. And um, here, silicon is uh, uh, indicated in blue. And you can we see that uh, the best efficiency that we can get is for 1.1 and something like 1.7. So that's the reason why we, we pick up silicon for the H2 for the uh, Those are the, the candidates we, we found. So uh, the 20 we screened before, they still work for us in this case. And then we found 12 more. And in particular, there's this uh, uh, nine bait series that is uh, experimentally known, and a uh, few of them uh, works for hydrogen evolution. Uh, sorry, for oxygen evolution. And um, instead, the others are perfectly unknown. Mm, something we started uh, six months ago is uh, to take the experimentally known materials from the ICSD database <coughs> and uh, to look at just the band gaps. Calculate the band gaps of that. And this is uh, in collaboration with uh, uh, some people at uh, LBN, LBNM and uh, MIT. Uh, we pick up something like 6,000 structures for the materials project that uh, is based on the ICSD experimental database. And um, we have calculated the, the band gaps with the G and B and C, and a few of them with uh, G not and W not. And uh, this is done also in uh, basically these calculations are coming. And um, we found a reasonable agreement between the, the two methods. And uh, now we are looking for different applications. Namely, we can look again at water splitting and uh, photovoltaics. So I'm not talking about the water splitting because I talked about uh, for enough about that. I will mean, look at the photovoltaics problem. Uh, so far in the photoelectrochemical cell, we have the light that is converted in hydrogen and oxygen. Uh, in a photovoltaic, instead, we have the light that generates the electric current. So the, the electron holes are created here, and then the holes there, and the electrons up, and then we have the sunlight. Um, several different methods have been studied in the last 50 years, and uh, so far the best efficiency is something like around 
So in general, it's way higher, higher than the current status of the photochemical source. We look at the thin film source because we want to save materials. So we don't want to. Yeah. Um, we want to have uh, something cheap, and uh, for that reason, we, we want to save uh, the, 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 the amount of material required to absorb the light. Um, we look at uh, the calculate absorption spectrum of uh, seven interesting materials, and interesting means uh, eco friendly. So me, uh, we, we exclude completely the elements that are uh, rare or too expensive, and uh, we look at only the ones that have a global production about, uh, about uh, three, 33 kilotons per year. In addition, we look only at materials with a band gap between 0.5 and uh, 2.5 electron volts just to, to have a good efficiency. Uh, those are the results for the single layer. So we found that the, the red curve here is the maximum efficiency, efficiency you can get out from a, from a solar cell. And we found 17 materials that have efficiency about 25%. So of course this is just a theoretical efficiency. If you want to look uh, at, the, at the real, I mean, in, a, in a real cell, then you need uh, to account for losses and uh, so on. So usually the efficiency is reduced uh, of more than 10%. So it would be something like 15 or, or something like that. Something like that. And only four of these 17 that have been already used so far in, uh, in solar cells. We have planned also to look at uh, the double layer but uh, I don't have time to talk about that. Uh, all the, the, these calculations are included in this uh, materials, computation material repository just to have an easy access and to share the data and to like, um, analyze that. So it's possible to go on the web of this address and uh, basically get the same uh, map and uh, find the candidates for what you need. Maybe you need something very uh, a large band gap insulator, and then uh, you can des uh, design your criteria and, uh, and find the results. Uh, these are again my conclusions and um, the, po the people I work with and uh, that I want to test. And thank you for your question. But uh, you can um, 
you need to have to enhance the charge transport and also the electron and so on. So usually it's done by with a membrane. That, uh, and then the membrane then has a problem that it runs a low pH or a very high pH. So and then it's uh, it's again a corrosion. There is a problem with corrosion. So it's this is a simplistic way of seeing the problem. I mean, yeah. just the first step to yeah. those materials can work there, yeah. and then it's uh, it's another point to, to build up in the real world. Nitrides and the oxyfluorides. Did you also look at the oxyfluoronitrides? Yes. Get a little yeah, yeah, they were. Here, yeah, there is the, the last <laughs> one. Uh, somewhere. I mean, yeah. And uh, the that, uh, usually, I mean, the cubic peroxide, then you have a very good uh, symmetry. But uh, as soon as you start replacing, then you, get, you create charges or you distort the, the symmetry, and then you tilt the table. And usually the tilting of the crater, then uh, it's uh, related to the um, to a lowering of the instability. So you can get some oxychloride or oxy nitrite stable because the the tilting is not that much. But as soon as you move to the oxychloronitrite, then you get that oxygen is minus two, nitrogen is minus <coughs> three, and fluorine is minus one. So you get something that is not stable at all. Even so if the mass, I mean, you can experimentally make it. But yeah, but not with this. Uh, I mean, with this criteria, probably you need. To, I, I think you need to study the like the orthorhombic structure. So something more with more atoms. And as soon as you stay with the five atoms unit, so then you don't, you don't get anything stable. But some of, some ideas are actually interesting. So if uh, if you can find a way to make it more stable, then we can uh, we can uh, add something to that list. <laughs>